Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Audit and Governance Committee of Tamworth Borough Council on Thursday, 10th of February, uh, 2022. Uh, I am the Vice Chair, as our former Chairman has uh, risen to better things and been appointed to Cabinet. Uh, I think it would be remiss of this committee not to firstly give our massive thanks to Martin, who was, who was in uh, with us this evening, who has chaired this committee for nearly four years, and uh, done a fantastic job of bringing it forward. Um, I would like to allow him a couple of minutes just to bid the committee farewell. So over to you, mine. Thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't just want to abandon you and leave you in the lurch, so I thought I'd come along since I would have been here anyway. Um, but yeah, thank you. You've been a great committee. I can't believe it's been four years. Um, but uh, I'm kind of sad to, to leave it because it was, you know, it is a really interesting committee when you get into it, and I hope you all still feel that way after you've completed your, you know, first year on it, some of you. So, um, but yeah, thank you, and I do hope uh, we continue to dig and delve, and uh, as um, our training always tells us, be the nosy child, um, because that's exactly what you need to, to do, and, and I'm glad to hear that the um, subcommittee is still going to be going on as well. But yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, if I do a rubbish job on Cabinet, I might be back here in a few months anyway. So, you know, who knows? But uh, yeah, thank you. And With thank all due you. respect, Chair, that may or may not be true of whether people <laughs> leave Cabinet when they're not rubbish. Well, yeah, OK. But uh, yeah, thank you for, for giving me the opportunity. And I'm going to stick around at the back to uh, carry on watching. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I don't know how appropriate it is, but I'd like to propose we, we do a vote of thanks for someone who's chaired this committee uh, in an excellent manner over the last... Uh, Four year, over the last four years, I'd look for a seconder on that one. Councillor Thurgood, all those in favour? And thank you, that is agreed. Thank you very much, mine. Best of luck to new chair, whoever they are. Brilliant. Uh, I'd also like to welcome our new member of this committee, Councillor Tina Clements, which brings me on to a po uh, item number one, the appointment of the chair to take this committee forward. Chair, chair, sorry. I think because of the way the council's constitution is structured, we should note that under... 242A, Councillor Clements has replaced Councillor uh, Martin Summers as a member of the committee. Since the chair of the committee can only be drawn from the membership, I think we should note first that she is a member. Uh, yep, otherwise you. it has to go through full council, so by doing it now we're making a note of it because as I understand the constitution, membership can be changed to reflect the wishes of a particular political group depending on which the leaving person he belongs to. Okay, thank so you. Are we okay much, to note that? Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor Playpoint. The committee and, and present, uh, I believe, has noted it and it will be recorded in the minutes. Uh, so, welcome to Councillor Clements, uh, which does bring on to uh, appointment uh, item number one on the agenda, the appointment of a chair. I would like to propose Councillor Clements uh, to be chair of, of the Audit and Governance Committee and would look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Greatrix, thank you very much. Uh, you've yeah, got your microphone up. Chair, may, may I ask that before the uh, vote is taken that the Conservative members declare that they are under a whip on this particular item since it's a decision of the Conservative group and is therefore declarable as a whipped item. It doesn't affect it, it means it's perfectly proper, but it just means you're observing the proper way of going forward. Um, no whip has been put on this vote. Um, the, the Conservative group would have taken have taken a vote on who they think should take the chair forward, but there are, there are no uh, no whip has been forced on us to propose Council Clements or to second her or even vote for her. Um, there is no whip been put on the vote uh, this evening. Uh, so thank I'm you for stating that it's the choice of the Conservative group. I'm not sure how that differs from being a whip. There we go. Uh, the whip would imply that we're being forced to vote for it, and and we, and we are not being forced to vote for it. Everyone is free on this committee to vote who they w wish to. Um, so before, I'm happy to move to the vote if, unless we've got any other recommend, uh, nominations. All those in favour of Council Clements. Thank you very much. That is approved. I will pass over to the new chair of the committee, Council Clements. Um, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Richard. Um, also, thank you to. Martin Summers, who I know is now sat behind me, which is very unnerving. 
<laughs> um, and I know that he's done a fantastic job on uh, everything, audit and governance. I think it goes straight through the middle of him. So uh, thank you to Martin for um, the work that he's done previously to myself. Um, so we'll move on with the agenda. Um, we have uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Councillor Ford. Move them, Chair. Do we have a seconder? Happy to second. Councillor People. Um, item three, apologies for absence, Joe. Okay, can we vote that the minutes were a true record, all those that were here? Okay, thank you. John, I take it you were absent, yeah, okay. And obviously I wasn't here either. Um, apologies for absence, uh, there isn't any. No, that's that correct, yeah? Okay, um, item four, declarations of interest. Has any member got anything they need to declare on any of the items being discussed this evening? No. So we move on to item five, which is the update from the external auditors. Um, and I believe that's Mark Stocks. Um, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a verbal update from me today. Uh, it's just three areas just to uh, talk you briefly through. Um, so I'm going to come off this, this audit. So I think I'll come back for one more committee to present the um, annual auditor's report um, but uh, Laurel and Griffiths who's previously been an audit manager um, at this uh, organization she's uh, been promoted uh, well by me to director so uh, so and she'll be taking on uh, on your audit um, for this financial year so but obviously Laurel knows quite a lot around Tam with having having worked here previously um, in terms of the uh, annual auditor's re report, I'd hope to bring that to this committee. It is it is ready. I've got a draft in front of me. It's just not quite um, ready to sort of put in front of, um, of Stefan and the executive. So I'll do that um, probably later this week or, or at least early next week once uh, I've managed to fi finalise my review. In, so members will recall that um, we look at three areas. We look at... Um, financial sustainability, we look at the governance of the council, and we look at its economy efficiency and effectiveness. Um, so there's no significant risks arising from our, our work. Uh, so that's that's a really positive thing for the council. Um, clearly, you know, there'll be comments uh, from us in terms of the uh, financial sustainability of the council and the level of reserves that, that, that it has, and particularly uh, the need to, um, uh, well, I suppose to try and get some surety from the government in terms of, of what the long-term future for uh, for financing local government looks like. Uh, in terms of governance, the, there's very little. There's very little that we've identified uh, that concerns me in terms of, uh, of risk or um, the way the uh, authority uh, operates in terms of its committee system or in terms of how, how officers uh, operate. Um, in terms of the three E's, there's, there's a little bit. So that I need to just um, discuss with, uh, with with Stefan and Andrew, sort of around um, around service planning and benchmarking. But you know, to be fair, fair to them, I'd like to talk that through. But you know, as I said at the beginning, there's no significant risks, and there's probably a sort of one or two improvement recommendations. So I think that's uh, that that's a pretty good outcome for the council. Um, you recall, sort of at previous committees, uh, particularly where at the accounts committee, uh, we talked about um, waste accounting, and sort of we've been trying um, to get a resolution to that. Unfortunately, we've not. Uh, so I, I called uh, my teams together yesterday um, just to just to chat through whether our our position had changed, and that's both the Litchfield team and the Tamworth team. So so we have a. Our position has not changed, so we're going to go back to Litchfield as well as to yourselves. So I'll be speaking to Stefan next week just so we can uh, get that accounting finalised before I disappear. So uh, that's all I wanted to update on, Chair. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thanks, Mark. Has anybody got any questions for Mark on the um, external auditor's report? No? Okay, thank you for that, Mark, and um, we'll look forward to seeing you again, and maybe for the last time, and last look forward to whoever, is it Laurie? Laurie. Laurie Lynn, okay, that, that will be coming to future meetings. Um, thank you, Mark. Um, just just quickly as well, that, that waste collection is, 
that's going to be there's no issues with that that's going to be sorted isn't it we'll sort it so the accounting may look we'll sort it the accounting may look slightly different but you know we, we can get a resolution that uh, i think will will suit both both parties so it's not it's not beyond our wit okay thank you okay um so moving swiftly on to item six uh the risk management quarterly update um that's stefan that's going to give us that this evening thanks stefan thank you chair so as members will be aware this is the the regular quarterly risk management update that we bring to the to the committee obviously this one is for quarter three of the 2021-22 financial year as at the end of december a copy of the current corporate risk register is attached to appendix a and shows little change uh, on the risk register, register since the last uh, meeting and over the last quarter apart from the decision not to engage with the peer review uh, this item will be removed from the risk register and then reinstated when it's been rescheduled uh, the risk control measure for management of assets uh, and the delivery of the corporate capital strategy and asset management strategy is highlighted uh, as red uh, as it's only partially completed we've had the surveys back now um, but they were delayed due to the pandemic obviously but we're, we're working for you know we're going forward working on those and when the corporate capital strategy comes to uh, council at, at the end of the month with the budget you'll see the latest position in there and then following on from the, the revised strategic uh, risk reporting format uh, that we approved last year, uh, work has started on developing a revised approach for considering operational risks uh, and the operational risk champions group have met to, to discuss cross-service risks and uh, they will report items of significance that could affect strategic risks uh, and, and what they picked up at the last meeting is the, the requirement for a, a social housing self-assessment driven in part by the, the high profile issue with cladding and as detailed in the report. Uh, and the final thing I'm going to say is about the uh, Aviva publication that's attached to Appendix B which details the top 10 risks identified by a range of organisations so they've done a, a survey of businesses uh, and it provides a wider view of risk management and business risk um, across a, a, you know, a whole sector of organisations. And what positive news is it does confirm uh, our view of our current strategic risks, risks are aligned with most business risks or what they consider the, the main risks uh, to, to business at the moment. That's it from me, Chair. Happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Stefan. Does anybody have any questions for Stefan? Simon? Thank you, Chair. Um, first question, if I may, relates to the peer review. Um, the peer review is our opportunity to be reviewed by other uh, m people who are involved in local government um, on a sort of LGA, almost not, uh, like a friendly version of an Ofsted, where they come in and sort of suggest things that we might do and so on. Um, why does that constitute part of the corporate risk register because to my mind it it's actually something you do to keep an eye on how you're going and I'm not not really sure why it's up there alongside you know whether we get any um, revision to new homes bonus or you know things that would actually financially impact on the council because as I understand it it is a sort of friendly nod from from the LGA team and in that sense we we can't be fined for it. in fact if anything the only thing it can do is say or oh, watch out there's a little bit of a landmine there that we encountered in some other council that you want to avoid so so could i just ask why it features in that in that bit thank you okay thank you chair um yes it, uh, if you remember how the we, we revised the corporate risk register we revised it to reflect the corporate priorities now, so there's that direct link between risk and priorities, but also the actions associated with those risks and or mitigating those risks and the corporate priorities. And the, the peer review self-assessment was one of those risks, uh, risk actions that mitigates sort of, sort of risks around governance. So it's not actually a risk, but it's a risk action that we're, we're taking off for now um, because, you know, mainly because of capacity issues 
but that, so it's an action that's coming up. So I, th I thought I would bring it to, to the committee's attention that we won't be taking part in that at the moment. Uh, so it will affect the governance risk. But what we are doing at the moment, and, and you're probably aware of this, Chair, is we are looking at the uh, what I mentioned earlier about the social housing self-assessment. So we're, we're actually get, having a baseline done for that that will then help us firstly uh, be compliant with the self-assessment for housing, but also set us up for when we do do the peer review because it will look at similar things across the authority in terms of the authority's governance as the external auditors do when they audit us every year. Thank you, Chair. Did you want to come back, Simon? If I may, um, I understand what you're saying, that it's taking a mitigation process out, but I still think it's not the same as what might genuinely be regarded as risks to the authority. But I'm glad that you've linked it to the issue of the social housing review, because um, the social housing review says that will future councils will be graded on a four-point scale effectively, um, which is sort of two levels of pass, you know, one with one with flying colours and, and one with slightly less flying colours, um, and then two levels of fail, which would yeah, be be about not not achieving certain standards. Now, as I understand it, we work incredibly hard as an authority to be a compliant housing authority. So I'm not entirely sure what this review is going to throw up that would be hugely about risks to the authority because to my knowledge, we're, we are going to be compliant, which puts us in the top two categories. Um, but at the meeting of the housing committee, the comment was made, it's a judgment on the whole council. How does it go beyond housing to the whole council? I mean, clearly if we were looking like being non-compliant, that would affect our reputation. But if we're compliant, what what's the risk? Because I'm a little worried that what's happening is that we're being told on the one hand that officer numbers are so thin that we can't afford to do the peer review. We haven't got the time to do the peer review which I, I can understand, but I, you know, that, uh, at the end of the day, if the cabin crew are not sufficiently strong in numbers that they've got time to check certain things are being done properly, then you'd worry that you haven't got enough pilots. So I'm, I'm, I'm worried that we're not picking up the point that everything now is about officer capacity, and yet it's been slimmed down to this level. Why is it then that we are worried about what would happen with the housing review and that becoming a, a sort of driver for everything. You know, it's a big role and we are an authority that retains our stock. But on the other hand, we're also very good. So I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to work out why, how we're going to pass this exam is creating a further problem at, at, in terms of priorities. Yeah, totally agree. Um, and echo all your points. I mean, from, from, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking at it on, on the face of it, I, I'd say, you know, I'd agree with you, our uh, processes, procedures, governance is sound. But until we've done a bit of digging, actually seen the criteria or gone through the criteria that the self-assessment is going to, to throw up, there's always room for improvement. So there could be policies, for example, that need updating. Um, we, I know we're just going through updating our organisational development uh, policy which which needed updating and we're just finalizing that but that could have been flagged up as a potential issue if we hadn't already gone through this but there, there will be other things that w will need updating um or haven't been and and uh it's i suppose it's good practice isn't it that that we, we have this self-assessment and it does flag up the issues or any issues that we do then get to cover a bit like the auditors do every year you know there will always be issues that, that are uh, flagged up but hopefully there won't be big issues and I say you know it, it shouldn't affect how we score overall you know if we're at the you know one of the better categories then that, that's good news but as with everything um, you know there is room for improvement hopefully that uh, did answer all your questions there <laughs> thank you thanks Stefan um, I'm guessing um this is just for my benefit, really, that the uh, when we do the the social housing final assessment report, that will include all our policies and procedures, and it will show up any weaknesses 
um, in that report. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, sorry, that was the other bit, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, <laughs> it, yeah it's an organisational assessment, as I understand it. So it doesn't just look at housing, although obviously housing will be a big aspect, but it also looks across the board. So, for example, at MTFS, you know, uh, for, for the general fund and that HRA as an organisation, they'll look at that, but it won't just focus on housing it, uh, and, and the other one, organisational development. It'll look at policies across the council, how we operate and the governance processes that we've got in place across across the authority. Thank you, Chair. And the other thing that I picked up, I'm guessing that the Aviva report, uh, most of what came out was that um, electricity, gas, uh, energy prices are going to go through the roof in April. Also, uh, the base budget for in, um, interest rates are going to go up with the Bank of England. How worried or not worried should we be that, that how that's going to affect us going forward? Thank you, Chair. I mean, in terms of interest rates, take those first. Obviously, the council does invest funds, so on, on a positive, we'll get a better return on our investments. Most of our debt is fixed long-term debt, and it does relate to housing, so it shouldn't really affect our debt uh, as it stands at the, our current debt levels because that is fixed, and you know we, we, we've, we've got long-term debt in it. We won't mature for another 40 years, so. But the, the, the issue with the... The, the cost pressures uh, f for the public is, is the main issue, really. Uh, obviously, we, we uh, monitor um, payment levels for rent, council tax, et cetera, uh, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. And we have a, a monthly meeting with the team uh, to, to talk about uh, the impact of, well, what was in the past welfare benefit reform, but going forward, it's going to be cost pressures. Um, and that comes to Corporate Scrutiny Committee on a, a, on a quarterly basis in some detail. So Corporate Scrutiny uh, will and Cabinet get to review that, uh, that level of detail. What, what I would say, obviously cost pressures will affect public finances. If people uh, do have any issues with payments of rent or cash tax, first thing, c contact us as soon as possible. And we can, you know, we do have hardship funding. We can look at alternative, uh, or putting them in touch with the likes of the um, Citizens Advice Bureau for further uh, debt advice, but also um, put them in touch with our benefits team to assess if they, they, if they qualify, qualify for housing benefits or local council tax uh, reduction support. Thank you, Chair. Any further questions for Stefan? Simon? Thank you, Chair. Um, I agree with you with your point about we monitor the other factors and, and there are considerable efforts gone to to help tenants and others so that's not an issue but I do have a concern that going forward this will therefore impact more heavily on the HRA side of the council's balance because I'm concerned that we've got a capital program and we know that that capital program will now be squeezed for cost because everything that we've planned to do will now cost more um, and, and you know from fitting bathrooms to everything else so I am concerned that we, we monitor that very carefully um, as you say the debt on housing isn't the issue because that's long-term public in, in, in most cases public work loans board loans and you're not allowed to change the rate of interest or pay them back so it's nothing we could do anyway so that's 30 odd years of debt going forward but the worry would be that whilst the debt can't be changed the revenue will come under under pressure um, and also the demand for social housing because clearly the more people struggle if they lose um, their private sector rented accommodation due to struggling to keep up with the rent then there'll be more demands on on us as an authority so I, d I do think that's something that we'll have to watch going forward as a risk um, and uh, Obviously, these are all the benefits of Brexit, which I didn't campaign for. So I shall leave those who did to think about the consequences of their actions. Stefan, did you want to come back on that, are you? Uh, only just to say that, obviously, yeah, we'll monitor the situation going forward on a monthly and quarterly basis with members. So, um, and, you know, as the, as, as the things emerge, we'll, we'll flag up the issues. And, and we have, uh, in the budget, you know, ref reflected the cost pressures on the HRA, uh, initially but again we don't know what's going to happen going forward 
whether the the you know the, the economy will stabilise and the uh, it's doubtful that the cost will go back down, but hopefully they won't go up anymore. So uh, so but yeah, but as far as we know, we've reflected that in the budget uh, for next year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Stefan. Are there any further questions, comments? Okay, um, we've got a recommendation that we um, that this committee endorses the corporate risk register, and obviously you'll keep us updated going forward. Um, everybody's been allowed to ask questions. Stefan's been allowed to answer them. Um, are we all happy to take that recommendation forward? Please raise your hands. That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you for that. Chair, I think Joe might need it. And a proposal and seconder to know. Okay, so we've got um, Richard for. Uh, I'll start again. Simon is um, going to propose it, and Richard Ford is second in it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, and moving swiftly on to item seven internal audit quarterly update report quarter three. Um, I believe that's uh, yourself, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present my regular quarterly report into internal audit progress to the 31st December 2021. I can report that we have fully completed 47% of the audit plan as of the 31st December and the current position is outlined within the appendix attached to my report. This details the completed audit work, assurance levels appertaining to completed audits and the current position regarding planned work to be completed during quarter four. In addition, I provided a summary of the follow-up reviews undertaken during the year on previously limited assurance reviews. Members will note that there are a number of audits to be completed during quarter four, and as part of our reviews, I wish to provide assurance that we are maintaining compliance with the public sector internal audit standards through management review of audit briefs, review of audit working papers, and sign off of draft and final audit reports. I hold regular meetings with our general auditor um, service supplier who is, who is TIA and the number of meetings have increased from monthly to fortnightly and coming towards the end of the, end of the financial year I'll be moving to weekly meetings with them to ensure that the work allocated to them is completed and obviously we maintain our standards to resolve any questions or queries that we may have. Following the completion of the IT audit needs assessment, the IT audit plan contains two audits, one of which is completed and that refers to payment card industry standards which I'll refer to it shortly and the other, the other area was ICT backup and recovery where we are just awaiting the final management responses to the draft report. I'd like to highlight to the committee that we have also that we'd obviously completed a review of payment card into industry standards and that this was graded as limited assurance. We have agreed recommendations with management and these are scheduled to be completed by the end of September 2022. The reason for that uh, timing of those recommendations is that it's, it's an area of cross-cutting issues across the authority so wherever we take payments for example then we need to make sure that we're compliant with those standards at assembly rooms the castle uh, customer services etc uh, members will also note that as we're currently not compliant with these standards a penalty payment is due and that is currently 225 pounds per month I can confirm to the committee that when we obtain full compliance with the standards and ratification from the sponsoring bank, this penalty will lapse and this will be completed by the end of September 2022. To enable this, we'll need to complete a full self-assessment and obviously submit that to the sp sponsoring bank for approval. I'm working with both um, ICT and accountancy to ensure implementation of the recommendations and I'll continue to review implementation with management and report to this committee the progress with those recommendations. Overall, I will also, keep, I will also continue to keep the audit plan under review and discuss performance with the Section 151 officer. During the period, we have completed the follow-up review of Street Scene and can confirm that from the original eight raised recommendations that seven have been fully implemented by management and one is no longer applicable due to this being superseded by system changes. This, re this review is now deemed to be of reasonable assurance. 
I've outlined and I would like to highlight to the committee as well that the currently outstanding audit recommendations as at the 31st December 2021. Between the end of quarter two and the end of quarter three, there has been a slight increase in the number of outstanding audit recommendations, 75 to 79. And my report outlines the overall movement in the total of audit recommendations outstanding. I should state here that part of that part of the increase that's involved around that is the number the as we've completed reviews, then recommendations have been added into that number and then recommendations have also fallen out because they've they've actually been fully completed by management. But overall there's been a there, there's been a slight movement of an increase of four. As at 31st December, there were 12 high priority recommendations outstanding and again these are being followed up with management at my quarterly meetings with them and as committee are aware and as, as I previously indicated, I hold those quarterly meetings with, with the assistant directors to discuss though, all the outstanding recommendations in their area and then obtain assurance that they are being completed and progressing. The recommendations outstanding are in the areas of GDPR and data protection, cyber security, health and safety and property management. There are no specific issues I wish to raise with the committee around any, any matters of reported fraud or irregularity during the reporting during the period and obviously we will continue to follow up any limited assurance reviews as required by this committee and closely monitor recommendation implementation. I'm happy to take any questions, Chair. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's my understanding that you joined the authority in June of last year and then you needed to have specialist procurement for some of the vacancies that we had. So um, just so that the committee are aware, you, you probably knew that, that Andrew didn't start until June of last year. I didn't, um, so I had to find that out. Um, so that that's why we're just slightly down on, on where we should be. Am I correct on that, yeah? Yes, Chair, that is correct. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, any questions for Andrew? Andrew. Thanks, Chair. <clears throat> just uh, just one for me. With regards to the outstanding audit recommendations uh, graph on page 33, can we uh, ensure that we have a more broader view of those actions? It's hard for... I'm a, a fairly new councillor. I know I don't look it, but you know, um, it, it's very hard for me to, to look at that and understand the trend data with uh, with only four data sets on show. I don't looking at that. I don't know whether it's in a, it's in a good way or a bad way. Okay. Thank you, councillor. Yes, I can take that on board. What what I can do is 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 put further commentary within the within the table or within the within the body of the report and maybe it would be useful as well to include the age of those recommendations as well going forward so that you've got you've got that information Simon thank you chair disappointed no you haven't been reading all our minutes all year just because you didn't know that you might be chair um, but no and Andrew did actually join us late and I was going to say presumably you can assure us that being in post at the start of the current the next year will mean that you'll be able to because I, I think the first time you came you said well, I'm really sorry I'm way behind but there's nobody here to do it then when you came to the next meeting you said well we're a bit less behind than we were which is great and that's true tonight I think you you've begun to close the gap so so that's you know that that's been a genuine effort to to try and catch up which is fair enough um what I wanted to ask you was, um, you said that you deal with the outstanding issues in your quarterly meetings with the assistant directors. Um, it's a f about five years since I retired, but I don't remember our head giving me three months before he met me again if there was a real issue in the department. So I'm just trying to work out why big outstanding issues don't come up more than quarterly Do, I mean I would have assumed you met with them more often to deal with things they hadn't yet done do you do you have enough authority within the authority that they are concerned to get on with implementing things that you have agreed our recommendations because as I understand it chair a draft report goes to the manager or whatever level is appropriate um, they then agree 
some of those things because it might be that actually that's a misunderstanding or a technical issue um, and that then the the outstanding items to be done are an agreed action list now whilst I can understand that you know perhaps on credit card payments that's quite a complicated thing to make a change to are department heads fully cognizant of the importance of carrying out and completing the recommendations or are you kept waiting longer than you should for them to actually implement them because the implication of this is that some things are sitting there not addressed thank you chair yes um in rela in relation to to sort of the outstanding recommendations what what i'd like to sort of bring to bring to the attention of the committee is that when i when i started middle of june we had something in the region of 130 outstanding audit recommendations at that time and through those and through those quarterly meetings we've managed to pare those down and get, get get the assurance from assistant directors via their managers in relation to to those actions so from that side of things i believe that having quarterly meetings is is appropriate in relation to that one of the other sides of the assurance side is obviously having the high priority recommendations the majority of those lie within limited assurance reviews that we've actually carried out so as part of the follow-up of those limited assurance reviews we're keeping it on on the on the radar of both managers and also assistant directors and obviously the the other side of the um, I suppose the other side of the core is my my regular meetings and my one-to-ones with uh, Stefan at section 151 but also I can obviously raise any questions with Andrew Barrett as chief executive if the progress isn't actually going along so at the moment I would suggest that the meetings are of an appropriate level and of on occurrence as well um, but again one of the things that I do 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 is obviously discuss any forthcoming audits with assistant directors and managers and obviously I take the opportunity then to also remind them about recommendations as well so I think I think that's where I would like to provide the assurance back to the committee on on that thank you chair did you want to come back Simon if I may thanks chair how many of those 79 were there a quarter ago because what we don't get told is if you like ha the, the newness of it if you see what I mean, it, it'd be like saying, well, I had 29 cans of baked beans last time and I've got 33 this time, but I'm wondering how many of them were stuck in the system three months ago. I mean, if you want to, I'm, I chair, if it, with your agreement, I'm quite happy to let Andrew go and check that. I, I wouldn't necessarily expect him to say now, but I, I think members will understand. I'm, I'm trying constructively to say, does he have enough support for getting outstanding issues genuinely addressed rather than sit there on somebody's to-do list um, and whilst I appreciate that you have been working through and there's less than there used to be my worry is you know are there six or ten of them sat there still not really resolved to the satisfaction of, of your your team and especially when we're having to get outsourced audit work done so it's not as though I mean when I first came to authority John Wheatley who we all remember <laughs> preceded Stefan I mean he was at that time an audit officer um, and he was in the building so if you know he'd been to someone and said you need to tighten up on this he'd see them in the corridor and say you know by the way how's that going that's not going to happen where you've got external auditors who can't you know have that ongoing relationship so it all comes through you. So I'd just like to know, and as I say, Chair, if you're happy, I'm quite happy for Andrew to supply the information when he's had a chance to check. But I, I would like to know that we're able to drive down those things that are you know, serious issues that you've raised and haven't yet been done. And are they particular to certain areas? And that that's not necessarily a personal thing. It might be the nature of those. I mean, for example, if there was cash handling in the cafe in the castle 
that doesn't go away as a risk. I understand that because cash handling is just everybody's red light for for all kinds of issues. But you know, are there things that you told someone that they needed to do six months ago, nine months ago, and they still haven't been done? Because if that's the case, then I think we as a committee ought to know that that's the case. Thank you, thank you, Councillor. Yes, I can take. I can take. Oh, sorry, Chair. No, it's okay, Andrew. Carry on. Are you happy to do that now, and uh, or do you want to do a, 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 a written answer to councillor people? I'll do a written answer back to councillor people and the and the committee in relation to the to the recommendations. But I think this goes back to the prior point made by other members within the committee about the explanation within that table as well, just to make sure that it is fully fully explained. So I will come back to committee on that. Yeah. I mean, Carry on, if, Stephen. If you look on page 32 of the agenda, there, there is a table in there, isn't there, uh, Andrew, that, that shows how many uh, recommendations there were at the end of the last quarter, how many were closed in the quarter, and then how many new ones. So it does give you a trend, but it doesn't give you the detailed information that you've asked for. But it, it also does say uh, there are 12 high priority recommendations that are overdue, as Andrew uh, mentioned, in those. Uh, ICT areas, GDPR, data protection, cyber security, etc. So, um, well, that, that was really my point, Chair, that it does actually tell us there are overdues. Andrew had alluded to it quite rightly, um, but I think that should be a concern to the committee. And, and, I, and I would suggest that, you know, when we're asking for that detail, it's not because we actually necessarily want to know that issue, but why is it not being dealt with? You know, can can the uh, and and in a sense, you know, is there a, a a response from the department that says I can't do this yet, or actually I wanted to do this, but I'm waiting for you know some industry standard to sign this off, which would be a more understandable reason for a delay. But I think you know how on on other um, things like project reports, if if things are going to plan, there's not very much comment. But if something is behind schedule, we'd expect a comment to explain why it's behind schedule. And I think, you know, 12 high priority issues that haven't been dealt with out of originally 140 you had. So being generous, let's call it 10%. If 10% haven't been picked up and dealt with, really, we should know why. And that and that's not because you're not highlighting them. And apparently it's not because managers haven't agreed them because they don't go on the schedule if they haven't been agreed. So that, that's what I'm, I'm really honing in on, Chair. Um, and yes, I'm not out of line at all with Councillor Cooper's point, um, but he's new and I'm not so new and I look even less new than he might. Um, so um, I'm just making that as, as, you know, it's there in the report, but let's, let's understand what it is, what things hold you up. Because things like GDPR, you know, I personally I think has been used to scare everybody witless and, and actually, you know, often is is not as bad as it as it could have been, um, though some people have fallen very badly foul of it, and and that's fair enough because usually those breaches are so blatant as <laughs> it's hard to believe that they thought that that wasn't something you had to protect, you know. Um, but uh, but I do think we benefit from knowing where the real sticking points are and are they within our control? You know, you could tell all the senior executives x needs sorting out but in reality we can't sort it out because it's waiting on something else but if it's not that you know for example if the delay in the customer portal meant we couldn't nail down two of those fine at least we know then why we couldn't do them all right thank you chair thank you simon and that's helpful for me as well understanding the data that's behind i had the same problem as yourself andrew where am I going with this? So it would be good to have that breakdown. Um, any further questions for um, Andrew? No, all quiet. Okay, so we've got um, one recommendation that the committee endorse the attached progress report. Um, Richard Ford has been quick off the mark to, to move it. Andrew Cooper has seconded it. Chair, could I ask that we have an additional recommendation that the committee's request for additional information on unresolved um, audit recommendations be included in future reports. 
I like to move that. I believe I've Councillor Ford seconding it. Yeah, Simon um, has just given us another recommendation, which you've just all heard. Um, Joe, did you get that? Yeah, and Richard has seconded that. Can we just have a, a show of hands for, for those in favour? Uh, that's uh, unanimous. Yeah. And you're happy with that, Andrew, as well, yep? Yes, I am, Chair. Thank yes, you. And, and I'm very happy to vote in favour of the first one as well if we didn't take a formal... Oh, no, no, absolutely. I, I just didn't hear the chair. It's, it's different style of chair, isn't it? Less, less commanding and more inclusive. I'll take that as a compliment, I think. It was intended as one, Chair. <laughs> and moving swiftly on to uh, to item eight is the audit committee effectiveness. I believe that's you again, Andrew. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to present my report on the self-assessment completed into the effectiveness of the audit committee. Best practice outlines that this should be an annual exercise and this follows sit for published guidance. To inform the self-evaluation, I circulated a pro forma questionnaire for completion by committee members, and I thank those members who have completed the respective questionnaire. These views have been incorporated into the self-assessment. The committee generally complies with the outline self-assessment to good practice. Um, however, there are, there are areas that I would highlight within the report, and obviously I will be making a later report around the appointment of an independent member, for example, and obviously then also the full completion of a self-assessment by members of the committee to allow um, a full knowledge and skills framework assessment to be completed. Um, I have included the self-evaluation questionnaire, self questionnaire for members as Appendix 2 of my report. Um, however, if, if members of the committee want this in another format, then obviously I can supply that following the, following the meeting. As part of the self-assessment, there were potential training areas identified from the com committee member questionnaires received, and specifically those were in the areas around governance, the role of the external auditor, transparency and internal audit. I would propose that these are considered as a trading plan for the 2022-23 municipal year. I would like to highlight to committee that at its meeting on, tw on the 23rd of July 2020, it was agreed to proceed with the appointing of an independent member to this committee. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the Head of, Gov Head of Governance leaving the authority, this was held in abeyance. I've included in my report a roadmap for the potential appointment of an in independent, independent member, and this is presented for consideration for by the committee. I would therefore like to present my report for consideration by the committee and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Any questions for Andrew? Richard? I think Simon was there first, but I'll go ahead and yep. take the chair. Uh, very happy to defer to the vice chair. Thank you very much, Simon. Uh, what, Andrew, what do you believe the likelihood of us actually getting an independent person to sit on uh, this audit committee actually is? The, the initial sort of indication back on 20th, 23rd of July was for an independent member which was going to be unremunerated apart from travel expenses. That was the, that was the actual recommendation approved by this committee. Um, to be honest, it's one of those things that until we dip our toe in the water, we're not going to be able to actually uh, do that assessment. And I think what, what I would like to do is sort of start the process in relate and seeing what, basically, what response we get back. Obviously, the other side of the, other side of the coin, and the, the, this, this goes back to the pros and cons of having an independent, independent member, is getting the person or persons with the right skills or the right skill set format for the committee. Um, and again, that's part of the... Part of one of the reasons why the roadmap is sort of from March to September, because the other side of it is that we also need to make sure that we do the due diligence as well. So I hope that that answers. Thank you, Chair. Did you want to come back, Richard? Yeah, uh, I believe I shared a photo, more me and Jess, with the former chair. Um, that I was, I had an email from a jobs website, and it uh, indicated that Peterborough Council were paying for their independent member. Uh, I just think. Um, would like your opinion on that and if we can't find a, an independent member to do it for free would it be something that you would think 
you think the uh, the committee should recommend uh, consider not recommend? I I think it's it's one of those where I su I suppose again looking at it Peterborough but also sort of London boroughs as well do remunerate for independent members, but normally that's that's from the side of a larger authorities to be honest I think my sort of opinion would be to go with the current unremunerated apart from travel expenses and then then take it from there if if we don't if we don't get a response or uh, there's very little response or we don't get anything anybody with the right skill sets for example then I would suggest that we reconsider uh, thank you. Just to, just to clarify that I wasn't actually endorsing us look, uh, looking to pay them. It, it was just to get your thoughts as I'd seen other, area, other council areas like authorities doing it. Simon. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had experience of this in the sense of when I sat on the WMCA uh, Audit and Risk Committee, um, we had an independent chair in that particular case. Um, and they were a very well qualified accountant with suitable background experience and in some ways they were very valuable and they were certainly very inclusive of members and you know recognize that we weren't all accountants um so I, I, that was a positive experience however my concern is that um with audit and governance yes you need people to be willing to understand what's going on in terms of the numbers but I worry that actually our value is in that we are not accountants and therefore we ask the questions that non-accountants would ask and actually we represent a population which will include some accountants um, but who are a very small minority of the people we represent and, and I do wonder sometimes whether the danger with an accountant sort of floated onto a committee is that they you know if they say oh yes well this is all fine members are then tempted to say well if it's all fine there's no need for me to ask any questions um, but actually the questions that need asking are not you know can Stefan add up and things like that which because we all know he can um, and probably get two different answers if needed um, but, but from a practical point of view you know, we employ qualified accountants who are, you know, regulated and they work very hard to do their job. But that's not the guts of this. The guts of this is, are we doing things properly? Are we taking risks we shouldn't take? Or are those risks being magnified that don't really exist? Um, but those are things that we ask because we're not accountants. We don't have an inherent grasp of this, that and the other. And we don't look at the world as an accountant. And I think that's actually very valuable. And I would say to all the members of the committee going forward, you know, don't assume that only an accountant can be an effective person on this committee. Because actually, the non-accountant who takes the trouble to work, see how the council works can be a very valuable, critical friend. Because we ask what we don't know the answer to already because we haven't been trained to know that line 48 is you know, related to line 23 and I think we learn a lot by that so my, my concern is if you do have an independent person chair in the future um, that they don't s sort of appear to have a, a, a sway beyond being one person on the committee and the other question I have is could you just clarify what does independent mean because <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying, for example, that I'd apply and come back. Um, but, but what I'm saying is, you know, what, what do we mean by independent in local government terms, given that some people may have signed someone's nomination paper? If I miss that, oh, thank you, Councillor Thurden. Yeah, well, I'll take it that if I go back to that section, I can pick that up. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the first question around um, having an accountant on the on on audit and governance as an independent member, I think I go back to my previous comment in relation to identifying the correct skill sets that you, 
you would wish to have on the on the committee and again i think that sort of not only sort of looks at the accounting side of things but it also looks at the governance side and also those other areas like you say having that probing 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 questioning mind to to actually then sort of provide that as a skill set going forward for the for the committee um, and I think that's that again is part of the I was going to say the recruitment process that we make sure that we've not when when we send send out a a job description or person spec around that that it doesn't just concentrate on accounting skills for example um, so I think chair if I may if it is about a probing questioning mind rather than accounting skills why do you need an independent member because surely everybody who sits on these benches ought to have a probing questioning mind and I'm not being funny I'm, I'm being genuine here that's not a challenge to you Andrea it's a challenge to the presumption behind the need for an independent member if they're not somebody with a very specific skill set and just a probing questioning mind then there's one two three four five six seven of us here already so that's my question I, I think it's sort of coming back to the the sort of the um, and maybe the probing wasn't wasn't the right right phrase shall I say I think I think it, it's coming back to the not only is it the accounting skill set but it's the governance skill sets as well and again my sort of knowledge from from previous audit committees elsewhere again it it hasn't necessarily just been an accountant that has cut that that has been the independent member um, there have been other chief auditors for example or audit professionals as well who've, who've applied from from that side of things so I think I think again it, it's it's having that that sort of I suppose almost oh being able to have the independent member who who is sort of open from all remits shall we say within within the area um, in relation to um, independence it's all right chair because I've just missed that because I only got back from France last night so I may have turned over two pages so apologies for that but I, that is covered in the report Councillor Thurgood pointed that out so that's fine Mark, were you um, offering to ha give some assistance there? I was offering to help a little bit. So, uh, so I, it's so I, I accept everything that that you've said. I think sort of you know members add a great deal to um, to the audit committee and to sort of the processes that we go through because because we don't just present the accounts, do we? We, we present lots of things to you in terms of of governance. Um, so the, there's a reality that local government accounts are, are just ever so, ever so complex. So they're probably as complex a set uh, of accounts as, as you'd see in any industry. So because not only um, do you have the sort of normal IFRS accounting, you have statutory overrides that move sort of money in, in and out. And so to for a, for a non-accountant to try and keep hold of that, I, I think is almost an impossible task. So, so one of the things that we've been discussing with SIP for over the years, and that the Redmond Review recognised, that that sort of bringing some of that independent accounting advice sort of to the committee, so they can so you can be supported, would be so sort of an advantage. And if you, I suppose, a comparator, if you if you went to the NHS or if you went to um, a commercial or audit committee, then they're they're bringing in different skills from across any number of uh, in industries so there's people with a business background there's people with legal backgrounds there's people with sort of uh, accounting backgrounds and and that that I think is the aim of so of, of this it's to sort of you know members are, are vital in terms of representing the public it's trying to give you the support that that you need to do an ever so complex job well thank you Moira. Thank you, Chair. Um, one of the very first things I said to Martin when I joined this committee was I feel completely out of my depth here. And I've been on it now for, um, I think, two years, and I still feel out of my depth. I have no accountancy or financial background whatsoever. Um, and I don't understand a lot of the terminology that you use. A lot of it literally goes over my head. 
I, I don't know if I'm on my own here, but when I hear reports from you, you both and, and the outside auditors as well, I am just happy to go along with what you've told me. Now, I don't think that's the basis on which I should be on this committee, but I, could there be any more in-depth training for new members on this committee who have no background, like I don't, and I'm sure several others don't? Um, because I personally feel, in a way, that I, I fail, if you like, because I am literally going along with people's recommendations and don't know enough to, to probe and ask you questions. Um, I think it was you, Stefan, said to me once, um, there are no silly questions, but I always think, oh, that sounds stupid, I won't ask that, because I feel I ought to know it. So, I mean, is there any more in-depth training that could be given to people on this committee? Firstly, Moira, your prob your, your, the question that you think is silly is probably the question that everybody else in the room wants to ask, but won't. So just ask it. Um, that's what I, I had a preemie, and that's what they've told me. So um, I'm not adverse to asking questions, whether it sounds silly or not. So I'm with you, but ask the question because it's probably the one question that everyone else is here is t wanting to ask, but doesn't. So just just get on and ask it. <laughs> Your questions don't sound silly to me. Oh, I'm sure they do tonight. <laughs> anyway, Stefan. <laughs> no, I was, was going to say exactly the same uh, as, as you, Chair. Um, there, is, there are no silly questions, you know. Everybody, you know, and, and, and what we said to you, Chair, the other day was, you know, it takes time to learn things. You know, you know it's not all going to be in there straight away. So it will, you know, you, you'll develop your knowledge over, over the period. It goes back to what Mark and Simon were saying about the independent member. If we do have one on the committee, they'll be there to support you as well as uh, with their knowledge. Um, but what, what we can do, um, as, and it, it's picked up in, in Andrew's report, is there is a self-assessment questionnaire in that report if you flag up the areas that you feel that you need more training on we can look to get that and that's the whole point of, well one of the points of this report is for you to well, all of all of you really to flag up you know where do you want more training and we can uh, we can arrange it I did send the, the form back and I'm afraid all mine were very, very low scores because I was being truthful and honest. I didn't want to put high scores making myself to be out something I'm not. Um, and that's where I feel I need that training to, to get to, to grip through the terminology. Um, and yes, if you like the questions to ask, to probe. Uh, as far as an outside person is concerned, my view on that is that they, I think they should have some sort of accountancy background or financial background because who, who, what are they going to say? They're going to be like me. Well, what are you talking about? And if they've not got a background in finance or accountancy or indeed um, council um, workings, what good are they? They need to have some kind of knowledge, either financial, accountancy or council work and, and you know compliances etc. Richard. Andrew. Thank you Chair. Um, yeah I, I'm not sure about training in accountancy. Uh, I think training in assurance to um, help looking at, uh, at gaps in process. I, I'm not accountant trained uh, thank God. Um, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> uh, I'm 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 trained in assurance, and that helps me to to see gaps and look at gaps. And I do think that there has to be an element of uh, of, of independence, as as as, as, as a caller people said, because um, and and I hark back onto the uh, the 2011 um, Kandahar um, crash in in Afghanistan, whereby um, the external investigation into that that was the the, the largest loss of British lives in in afghanistan found that actually their their assurance was low because there was no independence there was no independence assurance checks it was all the all the all the checks were done by internal um, aircraft raf technicians and they failed to see some of the gaps they all assumed they were experts and actually what they needed is somebody from the outside to come in and have a look and go no i think you've got some gaps here and and i think that's a, a that that so that it's, it's important for us to keep hold of that in independence so um I would suggest that some assurance training uh, rather than accountancy training because we don't all want to become accountants. Trust me. It's never been. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
Sorry. I, I mean, I wasn't suggesting that we you know, train you up to be all accountants because, um, I mean, as you said, it, it, I mean, it's really complicated. So, you know, what, what you spot on. You want you, what we you need training in is is ha what what are the right questions to ask, as you say. So it's more about you know your role on the committee. What what are the things to look at and, and point you in that right direction? Not training you up in local government finance because. I mean, there's not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Stefan. Are there any further questions, Peter? Actually, not a question, more comments based on what Maru was saying. I tend to find that if I can go through the reports, the agenda items, um, probably twice, three times, that gives me an idea of what's going on. Um, the with regard to um, <laughs> the independent um, member, the ideal person that I've seen in the time, short time I've been on the committee was Councillor Faulkner. Um, but sadly, the criteria for being a, an independent member is you mustn't have um, been involved with the council as a member or as a, an officer for five years. So that immediately lets him out, <laughs> um, sadly. but. Uh, <laughs> There we go. Thanks. Simon? Uh, just to say, I think that it, it's also very important that the controlling group think about the allocation of councillors. Because I've been in the controlling group and I've been in, in the opposition. And I've sat on this year nearly all scrutiny committees bar one. And it's interesting that on the scrutiny committees, say for example corporate scrutiny we've had a large number of experienced members who are chairs of other committees and things um, actually if you think about it the best place for new members is on individual scrutiny committees where they have an opportunity to get to know a particular area or a particular line and some of the more experienced councillors should therefore sit on something like this which is you know, something where, as I think, you know, um, Councillor Greater has, has spoken terribly honestly, it's incredibly hard to arrive on this sort of committee new, given all the terminology that you're assumed to know straight away. Um, I mean, Councillor Thurgood has huge experience in industry, and if he says he needs to report, read the reports two or three times, then that shows you the challenge. And I, and I genuinely think that one of the things you have to do is look at it and say how can we best deploy people because there will always be new councillors there will always be old councillors um, or shall we say long experienced councillors um, and because um, obviously I'm not old um, and, um, and, and and therefore you know there does some need to be some thought you know d do you stack corporate scrutiny with loads of experienced councillors who can, to a certain extent, judge when they want to put a tough question to the leader or not? Um, or do you say, well, the leader can go to those meetings and take what comes, which might be a naive question from a new councillor, but actually reveals something important to consider. Whereas councillors sitting on this committee are, on the whole, people who've done some time and therefore have an opportunity. Now, obviously, if you had an, an accountant or an assurance expert, come on the committee that makes sense because you're using the skill set but it is worth thinking about because I do worry that some of these official reports that go out come back recommending that the accountants are subject to scrutiny by accountants and I was quite surprised to find out from the former chair that in fact I asked more questions than my esteemed colleague who was an accountant and I asked myself is that because I'm not an accountant so I haven't followed the same train of thought to get to where we are today. And therefore, my value is in asking questions. And, and that's what it should be on this committee. And if the answers are all there and we're satisfied, great, move on. But don't let's not ask the questions because I too, because I'm properly trained and have a background in local government accounting, know exactly how I would have fitted that into that particular slot. But maybe I'm just a dinosaur and I'll soon be extinct. So you don't have to worry. But there you go, there's my thought. And I, I believe the Vice Chair wants to come in at the end, so I thought I'd come in now so that he could come in at the end. Thanks, Simon. Oh, sorry. 
with your permission, of course. You may speak, Vice Chair. Uh, I genuinely forgot what I was going to say, and forgot. <laughs> I, I, I put my hand. Um, I, I do agree with your comments. This, this uh, committee does need experienced members. Um, the issue we have is that the experienced members seem to be scrutiny chairs, and they are not allowed to sit on audit. I was booted off audit when I became a scrutiny chair a few years ago, uh, so that might explain uh, a little bit of the, uh, little of the answer. Uh, I'm happy to move both of the recommendations on block, Chair. Um, thank you. Just for Simon's benefit, I have made a note of what you said about where we put people on committees. So um, I'm sure myself and the vice chair can speak to the leader and just mention that to him um, if he's still the leader in May. Who knows? Obviously, um, Chair, I wouldn't comment on the latter. <laughs> um, can I just ask, I'm being slightly put in a difficult position here. I'm quite happy to support the primary recommendation, but the one regarding independent members, I'm not sure. Could I beg committee's agreement to take them separately so that I can vote? on independence differently to the other one? I was going to suggest that potentially we could have a uh, further discussion on this in the March meeting. Um, uh, the the recommendation, uh, the timetable states that, the, that it's going to be done in March, uh, the first part of the seeking the independent. So if we could have a bit of a more in-depth discussion at the March meeting, I think, uh, take it away, have some thoughts outside the meeting, uh, maybe some informal chats with, between members of the committee with the agreement of the chair. Um, I, know, I know my vote's not critical, Chair, but if on that understanding, I'm happy to join with everyone else. Um, so I'm recommended we pa pass one and defer two to the meeting in March. Um, just one second. Yep. I think you're ahead of yourself because I think uh, John wanted to come in. I did, but listening to that, I'll second that. I was going to second the original, but I'll second that. Okay, so we've got two recommendations, members. The first one is that the committee considers the attached self-assessment checklist and endorses any actions to improve its effectiveness as appropriate. You've been given the opportunity to ask your questions and Andrew and Stefan and Mark have all, uh, have all given you some really um, uh, fluid answers there. So on the first recommendation, number one, um, do we have a proposer? Richard, do we have a seconder? John Chesworth. So, um, all those in favour? Okay, so we've done that. Well, that's unanimous. And then the second one, um, Richard has just asked if we can take that for a, uh, a wider discussion and some thoughts before the March meeting, which I believe is March the 22nd, um, and bring that back to that meeting. Um, do we have a proposer? That's Richard. Do we have a seconder? That's John. Though All those in favour? Okay, are you happy with that, Andrew Stefan, yet? Yeah? Yes, fine. Okay, that, Jeff, thank yes. you. Could I just ask um, and remind members that if you can complete that self assessment checklist and that will inform sort of the training programme going forward? I know, I know Maura, you've, you've done yours. <laughs> okay, obviously that's quite important. Obviously, I haven't done mine because I'm only here tonight, so. I will get mine done, and mine will probably be just as low as Moira's, to be fair. <laughs> um, uh, I think I think only two people completed them, didn't, and they've just put their hands up, Stefan, so the rest of you have just dropped yourselves in it. Okay, we'll move on to the um, item nine, which is the Audit, audit and Governance Committee timetable. Um, let's get the right piece of paper. So this is a timetable of when things happen and you will all be au fait with it and obviously I'm the new person here. So March, um, let me just check that that hasn't gone onto that page. Okay, so March we have the review of the constitution and scheme of delegation, is that correct? Yep. The agenda for the March meeting is looking very, very uh, long. So, I th with your permission, I think if, if we go through and see which reports we can push forward or defer to the to, to the June committee, which is less busy. Um, okay. So, do you want me to start at number one and we'll go through them then? Yeah. Can, yeah okay. So, number one, uh, role of the audit committee. That's already for June. Oh, right, on the last page. Sorry, bear with me. 
Right, so number one, Audit and Governance Committee update. Can you just use your microphone, Mark? Sorry. So we're going to defer that one, yeah? Yes, that's fine. Auditors and... Chair, Chair, can I just ask, that means deferring the audit letter or can we deal with that in That's the summer? Five, yeah. It's just that we were due to get a report today. We've had a verbal update today and then they're meeting with the senior managers next week. So in theory, in March, we should at least know the outcome of that. I would have thought we should yeah. be advised of that before the end of the municipal year. So I'd have thought that element of it should come in, in March. Okay, yeah, that's number two on the list. Yeah, so the auditor's annual report, that's for March. We're, with, we're okay with that, yeah. Number three is the audit plan. Um, are we deferring that till June? Yeah, okay. Uh, number four, informing the audit risk assessment. That's okay for March. Yeah. Uh, the fee increase letter, June, because obviously that's going to come as... Yeah, come with the plan, yeah. Uh, review of the Treasury Management Strategy Statement, number six, June. Yeah, de defer that one, please. Uh, number seven, uh, the final accounts, March. Yeah, March. And number eight, internal audit charter and audit plan. We're okay with that. Yes, Chair. Yeah. yeah. And the last one, no, it's not the last one. I've got another page. Uh, Councillor Code of Conduct, we said... Um, are we looking at June on that one? Because we're waiting on the LGA, aren't we? Okay. Uh, number 10, review of the constitution and scheme of delegation for officers, June. Review of financial guidance, June. Annual report of the Chair of Audit and Governance. Um, obviously, that will be um, Councillor Summers' report due in March. I think he's agreeing to do that. Chair, I'm, I'm not sure that that can be the case because you are now the chair, which means that during the year it's either a joint report, but it would be normally we take the committee reports in June, having completed the municipal year. So, and, and I, I don't know whether I should raise this, Chair, but I think the chairmanship can't now be altered until at least August because um, you can't revisit the chair within six months. So unless you're elevated to the cabinet, I think you're going to be chair in June. So um, So that the report's going to be from me then? I would, I would think it would have to be, though I'm sure obviously you'll I'll, I'll, collaborate I'll, with I'll, your predecessor I'll, I'll, to ensure I'll, it covers the whole year. Speak to Martin outside of this meeting. <laughs> yeah, I, I wouldn't be in front of you, but I just think no, no, in due appropriate way yeah. of doing it would be that. Okay. Um, let me just make a note there. Uh, item 13, reset and recovery, were good for March, yeah. Um, and then in green it says private meeting of internal and external auditors and committee members, March. Yeah, yeah uh, okay. Yeah. It would be good, Chair, if you carried on that um, approach that the previous Chair did, that we had an opportunity in confidential to discuss okay. items that might be of concern. Okay, Joe, you've got your hand up. Okay. Chair, we also need um, an opportunity to discuss the recommendations of the audit subcommittee, so we need a confidential section in the March meeting, so we'd need the item to exclude the press and public, and then we'd need the item for report from the audit and okay. Richard, government did subcommittee. Did you want to come in on that one? Yeah, Richard? I was just going to slightly alter Council People's proposal, saying uh, after the the, the audit for the audit and governance meeting, directly following every audit and standards subcommittee meeting, we do set a private uh, exclusion of the public section of the meeting as a standard item. Well, I think I think that was implied by us having a private meeting, but you got yeah. I I wasn't trying to preempt you on on that because obviously you're the vice chair and terribly important. Um, but 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 more because we were talking about items that mustn't be forgotten, 
And I think it's really important that those audit and governance subcommittee recommendations are looked at um, before we go into the election period because they'll need to go to cabinet under confidential and again it you know better done before the end of the year thank you joe have you got that listed as um we need a exclusion of press and publicity at the march meeting thank you moira did you want to say something yes <laughs> um, on the annual report of the of the chair um councillor simon said that the chair can't be changed until august um i just like to remind everybody there is an election in may and that would mean your good self needed to win that election if you didn't then you wouldn't be the chair till august just wanted to make that i'm sure you will win but i just wanted to make that point i, I was so only that, pointing two out people that have tried to get rid of me already <laughs> no 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 chair i was actually offering a reason why you'd have to stay but uh, no, for, for you're obviously you have to win, but you also have to be on the committee because if you were reassigned, then obviously you can't be chair. But I'm just making the point that I believe under the constitution, a committee can't revisit its chairmanship within six months because we did have a situation where one of the conservative group resigned um, uh, and, and it couldn't then be changed back again for six months. So um, that that's, uh, it just occurred to me that that might be an issue but it's not a big issue because i'm sure you're going to settle into the role thank you for your vote although if you keep mentioning whether the leader's going to be leader in may he might want to get rid of you thank you for your vote of confidence simon i knew i could rely on you um so everyone's happy with the timetable of uh, of of where we are and what we're going to be doing in march and what we've deferred to june um so that brings us to the end of tonight's meeting we don't have any anything under um, confidential. Um, so thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for bearing with me while we went through those reports. Thank you to um, Stefan and team and Mark over there that have had to put up with me for two meetings prior to this, asking those silly questions, Moira. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all at the March meeting and uh, safe journey home. Thank you. Thank you.